Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Bryant. I'm the head of commercial for the ODA. Uh, this is a bit of a double act, this commercial presentation. I'm going to be joined in a minute by uh, Graham C. She's CLM's commercial director. Now, before I really continue, I've got a, I have a small confession to make, which is some of our compatriot speakers over there have accused Graham and I of having quite a dry presentation. Uh, to be fair, I've never yet met a commercial QS who's got a sparkling sense of wit and humour. Um, so I've done my best here. With, uh, with This is a picture from the Trafalgar Square celebrations after we knew we'd won the bid. Uh, that's about as funny as this gets, I'm afraid. But, um, <laughs> what I'm going to do is briefly talk about the, the ODA's commercial setup, if you like, the strategy around governance around procurement and commercial. Uh, the strategy actually for how we incentivise some of our contractors and CLM themselves. And then I'm going to talk a bit about dispute resolution and close that as well. Then I'm going to hand over to Graham who will talk more in detail about some of the Tier 1 contracts and how, we, how CLM actually manage them on site. Before I get into the meat of it, it's worth just emphasising a couple of things that the other presenters, especially Kenna, have already said about the constraints around what we're doing. So we had this immovable deadline and it's worth bearing this in mind that as, as Graham and I go, and go on to talk about how we adapted a commercial model to fit the programme. We always had to bear in mind this immovable deadline and the fact that we're a public body. Just because it was a special project didn't mean we got any special dispensation. So we're still accountable to, uh, to abide and comply with the public's contracts regulations and we have the highest standards of transparency and accountability for public money. So the NAO, for example, audit us at a very regular basis and are in at the minute looking at our management of CLM, no less. It's also worth just then reinforcing the integrated team approach we had with CLM. So the contracts were with, with ODA. The party to the contract was the ODA and the relevant Tier 1 contractor. However, we did not manage those contracts ourselves. CLM on our behalf were the project manager and the commercial manager, although they were much more than that. Obviously, they were a delivery partner to us. So whilst ODA agreed and set the strategic direction for commercial, CLM actually led the operational activity, including all the management of the Tier 1 contracts. And it's worth just saying here, also, there was the overlay of ODA governance and assurance. And assurance, I think, sometimes is quite a dirty word. I heard Jason yesterday talk about uh, a nervousness around assurance. And I think I've, I've seen in other pro public sector projects I've worked on almost too much assurance. Uh, it frightens, I think, sometimes private sector delivery partners and project managers away. Here, it was a very different setup, as I'll talk in a minute. But I think the assurance worked well. Part of this now, I think, one of the biggest commercial lessons that we've learned is around governance and actually driving the right culture and the behaviours to succeed. You see there that we selected a standard form of contract, the NEC3 suite of contracts. So both for our Tier 1 contractors and we enforced the use of the, the subcontracting element of the form of the NEC contract for their subcontracts. Our delivery partner, CLM, are also engaged on a professional services contract version of the NEC3. And I think that you really have to drive behaviours and with, through training and through workshops and through engagement with all the staff, both on ODA and CLM and the Tier 1 contractors, to really get the benefit of the contract and make it work for you. And I think that is a key lesson that we learned. It's also important to understand, our, I think, our approach to disputes. And I will talk more in detail about this. But rather than just an adjudication panel and compliance with legislation, we have an independent dispute avoidance panel, almost like mediation, really. So that's written into every single one of our Tier 1 contracts, that either party can actually elevate a disagreement through to IDAP. And I do think perhaps this is one of the most important points I'll make today, is the empowerment of individuals, both of the delivery partner and individual staff within. It's very tempting as a client to almost go overboard with control and micromanage everything, try and look at every single instruction that people are going to issue, look at every single compensation event. My points really around governance and assurance are that ODA set up the framework within which we wanted CLM to operate, gave strategic direction around commercial matters, set down what our approach is going to be, and then let CLM get on with it, actually go and manage the contracts. So whilst there was integration with, between ODA project sponsor and the CLM commercial team, really the ODA commercial team came slightly later in the day and didn't interfere with what CLM commercial were doing. A key point also is the delegated authority. So the CLM and ODA teams had delegated authority limits that are appropriate for the size of the project. You've heard Gordon already say that the project sponsor had a delegated limit of 250,000. So did CLM as a, as a whole. Their letter of delegation gave them 250,000. So as long as it was within the, program sorry, the project contingency, I should say, 
they could actually make the changes to the make changes to the contract and actually make things happen. So they weren't caught up in this horrible cycle of meetings after meetings getting approvals sort of sign off in triplicate just to get a compensation event agreed. Appropriate governance really is the key. We still have a lot of scrutiny in the public eye. We still have the NEO come into us. As I say, they're in at the minute. They come in almost every month to audit what we're doing in some way, shape or form. And they're very keen to see how we manage the contracts and our supply chain. So we have that scrutiny. To deal with that, as I say, we established a framework within which CLM could operate commercially. We had a procurement board where CLM and ODA would come every month to make, that was empowered to make decisions. So key decisions around procurement strategy would be made there and we would move on. In the same way, we currently have a commercial board that Graham and I sit on to try and make decisions or that we do make key decisions around disputes, around settling contracts, closing contracts out, as that's the phase of the project we're now in. The separate ODA commercial team does provide guidance and direction. However, it's probably a key point to make that our commercial team is very, very small. And in fact, a large part of it always has been the management of the CLM contract, which has been kept completely separate from anything else. So with the, uh, with the idea that any issues commercially that we had with CLM would not impact on performance. So CLM would be enabled and empowered just to deliver and not worry too much about commercial matters that were being discussed around between our commercial teams. I think that ownership and accountability is also very key, specifically with NEC, specifically with our uh, choice of contract. It is quite labour intensive, it's quite resource, resource heavy. There's no denying it. But I think if you adopt, with, as we did with CLM, a, a true spirit of partnering, and as they did with the Tier 1 contractors, so it's spread through, through our entire supply chain, I think if you adopt that spirit of partnering and you actually enable them to take ownership of what they're doing, rather than continually assuring what their, what their activity, I think it, you really see a, a definite benefit in delivery. So I'll briefly talk a little bit about procurement now and how we set ourselves up within those frameworks. There's an inter integrated procurement team with, with CLM, uh, led, by, led by CLM in terms of the strategy and actual individual procurements for construction. Uh, ODA did assure all of the procurement activity undertaken to make sure there was a consistent framework uh, of approach. And we did install, as Gordon's already said, we installed a, a whole suite of management tools and policies, uh, mainly led by CLM, to be fair, um, to actually ensure that through e-tendering and e-evaluation, the use of Compete4, which was a portal for use by ODA and all of our Tier 1 contractors, and, and Tier 2s for that matter, that actually we reached as wide an audience as we possibly could and engaged with as much of the supply chain, both local and national, as we could. The flexibility of approach and the inclusion of priority themes is quite a key lesson, I think, for us as well. You'll see on the next slide the balanced scorecard approach that really embodies the priority themes. So things like health and safety that Ken has already talked about, environmental sustainability, equality and inclusion. When we evaluated our bids, the strategy wasn't just what's the cheapest price, it was value for money in the truest sense. So value for money that incorporated all of our requirements, all of our strategic goals. And there it is. So this, this is our balanced scorecard approach that we developed. And this was actually written into every single one of our Tier 1 contracts also for subcontract procurement. So they had to abide by this. So really we ensured the flow down from us through the Tier 1s through the Tier 2s and th Tier 3s. So you can see clearly there's a, a genuine emphasis on cost and time. Like clearly we had a, an immovable deadline and an immovable budget for that matter. But... With equal importance, you have health and safety, equalities, inclusion, environment and quality. And as Kenna said before, legacy, which was our ultimate goal. So all of these were in, instigated at the procurement stage. Now moving quietly on to commercial and our strategic approach there. One of the questions that I'm often asked is how, how, did you, how do you incentivise people? How do you incentivise people within and your, your contractors within such a limited amount of time that you had? Is you can't, it's an immovable deadline, you can't you can't do anything other than, than hit it. The reality is that instead of using what I would call negative incentives, so overly onerous delayed damages or other penalty clauses, or retention, because a lot of contractors have seen that, it's certainly talking to me, as quite a negative thing, a hold-up of retention early on at the start of the contract, we actually minimised their use of retention, the idea being that we would incentivise them instead by milestone payments, and a lot of our contracts, as I'll talk about in a minute, were target cost under the NEC option C. So there's a contractor share there. So 
the, bene the benefit really of that is a focus on positive incentive and getting the right attitude and the right behaviours. Underpinning all that is the ODA's predominant commercial decision, really, which was risk should be owned and managed by the most appropriate party. It's no good giving CLM, for example, the, the responsibility for hitting that programme and penalising them if they don't. In the same way, it was not. We just couldn't have given Sir Robert McAlpine on the stadium the overall financial cost impact of us not hitting the games. So if the stadium hadn't been available for the 27th of July, we couldn't have expected Sir Robert McAlpine to, to pay. You can't quantify the amount of damages that that would have been to us. Underpinning those on our choice of contract of NEC3, as, a, as I've said before, is the, really the training programme. We established with CLM a, an NEC3 training programme that went through CLM, through ODA's commercial team, and out into the Tier 1 contractors. So, certainly some of our Tier 1 contractors, for example, the contractor on the velodrome, had really not a lot of uh, management experience of NEC3 at that point. So it's really, it was really trying to engage with our supply chain and put our arms around them and make sure everybody was brought up to the same standards. Another big lesson learned has been around decision-making, I think. Actually being agile with it and, and almost aggressive enough to make decisions quickly rather than we, we simply didn't have time to wait around and make decisions when we felt like them. They had to be made and progress had to, had to move on. So with that in mind, our key commercial uh, governance items are the commercial board that I've talked about already. But also this commercial compliance and assurance working group. That was ADA Commercial's assurance regime. So we'd actually come in and do in-flight audits of CLM as they managed the contracts to make sure standards of tra and transparency were maintained. The other things we implemented have been this independent dispute avoidance panel that I'll talk about in a second, and also commercial closeout. I think that's a big lesson, although I'll talk about it again. It's a massive lesson, which is to try and look at commercial closeout, closing out your contracts individually as soon as you can. So don't wait till the end of the job. It's, we established our commercial closeout policy back in 2010, whilst a lot of construction was still ongoing. And I think that really also helps to drive the right behaviour. You're looking really to end up with a contract that's easy to turn off, that you can close out quickly, without a lot of debates and disputes and unpleasantness. Just a quick note on the NEC. We've, it was predominantly work. Well, as far as the construction of the Olympic Park is concerned, it was entirely NEC3 that we used. And we used the, most of the main options, AC, E and F, even a management contract for our landscape and public realm uh, in the North Park. We also used framework contracts. <laughs> And, as I said before, CLM are engaged on a professional services contract under the NEC. All our Tier 1s required to flow our incentives down and our, our requirements and strategies, as I've said before, down through the engineering uh, construction subcontract and even the short subcontract. We did make some key changes to the NEC. There aren't any Z clauses in our version of it, so we, we took all of those from the back and actually wove them into the, the main body of the contract. Some people do see that as a slight negative because people do like to see the standard NEC and see, what, see what's been changed in the Z clauses. However, most of the feedback I've had has been, quite, has been uniformly positive, really, to say that it makes it easier just to look at one contract rather than having to con constantly look at the back. We added some additional con collateral warranties. LOCOG required collateral warranties, most of our stakeholders did, like LLDC and the LDA even. Enhanced payment terms, that, I think that's also been quite a key thing in incentivising our contractors. 18-day payment terms is, is quite unusual, certainly it has been for me, but it's something that I think the contractors, again, uniformly appreciate, and it helped really maintain the attitude that ODA is holding the cost risk on this and keeping your cash flow moving. We wove into our contracts, we stipulated the dispute avoidance panel. So it's not mandatory, as I'll say in a minute, but either party can refer a disagreement to dispute avoidance, and it's in the contract for that purpose. In the Tier 1 contracts, we've actually mandated competitive tendering and flow down of our, our risk provisions through the subcontracts. Now, just some lessons learned around the perhaps slightly less massively positive things about our use of it. Our resource requirements, you, you, it is labour-intensive, and it does require a significant amount of commercial resource. I think, if I'm right, the, the combined total of ODA and CLM commercial at its peak was about 130 staff. So with about 10 of us being in ODA commercial and the rest of them, 120 being in CLM. Most of that is around change management. I think the NEC is wonderful in its use of compensation events, but you have to keep it moving. So you have to keep moving within the timescale, and that takes resource. It takes active management. I think supply chain knowledge and, and training is also a key lesson for us. It's actually engaging with the supply chain rather than just hitting a, a contract on the desk and expecting everybody to understand it automatically, but engaging with them early, explaining what we we're going to do, explaining what our, our intent was, and helping and training them where they needed it. 
And the big point I think that Graham will probably talk about later is the incentivization. Specifically for us, most of the contracts were option C. I mean, there were a couple of, of uh, fixed price option A contracts. But a lot of the incentives were milestone payments plus the contractor's share under the target contract. I briefly mentioned we'd established an independent dispute avoidance panel. I think some people found it quite controversial when we started off. It was established by the ADA. Basically, it's a, a panel from mainly chosen from the ICE, but a panel of industry experts that ODA pays for. So it's a client paid for service. There are quarterly meetings of this to try and get these experts onto site so they understand the projects. So you're not just sending something off to a panel of experts that has no idea about the project, no idea about the Tier 1's problems that they've seen on site. As we've seen, it has been included in each construction contract. It's not mandatory, but it can consider disputes at any level of the supply chain. Uh, to put it into context, we've only really put forward, I think, five or six things through IDAP as a as a client and through it with CLM. But there have been numerous things through the Tier 1 to Tier 2 supply chain. But it has been wonderfully useful, I think, to emphasise the resolution of disputes within our supply chain before they became formal. So ODA and the cost risks, most of these are uh, target-based contracts. So therefore, we cared very deeply about disputes between our Tier 2s and 3s or Tier 1s and 2s. And I think this has been a use really wonderful tool to, to flush some of those out. And the last thing really is just to focus on commercial closer. As I said, this is something we set up a couple of years ago, and it, it's been absolutely vital, I think, to us. We're at a point now where we've only really had two adjudications through this programme, one of which has been suspended. So on such a massive programme with such, with such high-profile scrutiny, with an immovable deadline, as I said before, it's quite wonderful to be able to stand here and say we've only had really one adjudication that went its course. And I think one thing that we have to dwell on, really, is CLM's management of the contract and the, the choice of NEC, the, which allows you to progressively close a contract. Through the appropriate management of compensation, it's closing down issues as they come, avoiding disagreements and disputes. We've actually been able to start closing our contracts early. We started as soon as last September, really, for some of the main construction contracts. And we stand here now, and we've only got about, we're, I think we're about 92% complete, aren't we, on the the value of contracts for construction. And we're only six months really on from the game, so it's, it's a fantastic thing to say. But other programs I've worked on, particularly in rail, I would have to say, these things are left till last. They're left to the end, and you end up spending two years closing out maybe 10% of the issues under the contract. So I think it's really, really important to consider how you're going to close your contracts almost as soon as you've let them. Just have a strategy in place. So that's it for me. I'm going to now hand over to Graham, who will talk more in detail about the individual uh, contracts and the suppliers, and we'll, I'll join you back for questions later. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Graham Siege, as uh, people have said. Um, I've undertaken a number of roles on the uh, Olympics. I'm currently the uh, commercial director for CLM. But I've also, I started on the job back in 2007. One of my first jobs was the stadium price was submitted on the day I arrived and it was to analyse that and negotiate the price and negotiate the contract. So I'm going to focus a lot more on the uh, project level and hopefully answer some of the questions that people have raised within, within the audience. The areas I'm going to focus on is sort of supplier contract management, um, cost and risk and integration management and uh, performance and control. There's a lot of overlap between those, and um, hopefully I'll be able to link from, from a project level into some of the programme level reporting and control measures that you've already heard about. In terms of the NEC, the contract structure is uh, fairly simple. So if you look at the top green box, we've got the employer, the ODA, we've got the contractor in the bottom green box, and over to the right-hand side we've got the project manager, which in this case was CLM, one party that we haven't mentioned uh, to date yet is the, the supervisor under the contract, who's in old-fashioned terms we call them the clerk of works, and they're shown on the, on the left-hand side there. And they're really responsible for quality and uh, defects, although there is a whole uh, another area is how we work with the supervisors between our project management team and, and the supervisors on the contract. In terms of the administering the NEC contract, many of you may know that there are guidelines and flowcharts within the backup information to the, to the contract. And we took a lot of those flowcharts and we overlapped them with our internal processes. So what we see, and I appreciate you won't be able to read the detail on this slide, 
but we took the NEC processes up the top there and we merged them with their own internal processes. And we shared that information with the contractors and say, this is what we need the, the information we require from you and this is why we need it. In other words, how do we go through our change control process with the information that you've given us? In order to manage contracts in terms of um, the NEC requirements, in terms of compensation events, uh, project manager instructions, quotations, acceptances and the like. We use a tool called Primavera Contract Manager. Now, I'm not sure if anyone in this room has ever used Primavera Contract Manager to manage that. One person. Poor you. <laughs> I found that we found it quite a difficult system to use and it's probably something we, if we were starting a major program again like this, we'd review, we'd review some other, other systems. It did give us the key reports uh, we wanted in terms of early warnings, compensation events and where we were. We just found it quite difficult to manage across a, um, a program of this size. Looking at um, supplier and contract management in more detail, um, cost management and performance management obviously focus on the, the volume of change and delivery of a particular contract. As people have mentioned and Mark started to mention about priority themes and how we drove those down into our supply chain and we drove them down into the contract, they were really captured in the works information and we, for each contract it was key for us to develop what I call the SODs, the schedule of deliverables, because it was without a clear schedule of what needed to be delivered in terms of things like cost reporting, security, health and safety, delivery management and all those things that were particular to our contract, we needed to quite uh, closely monitor those and make sure the contractor was delivering. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, incentivisation and, uh, on the next slide, and I know Mark has, has touched on that already, and then focus on very much linked to, our, to, to the supplier management is the risk of integration management and management of delivery and change. As Mark said, many of our contracts use the, the NEC Option C form of contract on the Olympic Park. You may have seen a slide up earlier and some of you are paying real attention noticed that we did let a lot of JCT contracts and that was uh, an issue um, due to funding on the village which maybe we'll touch on later. So within the contracts we have a fair, what we consider is a fair pain gain share mechanism. On the stadium I'll give you an example there's a straight 50-50 pain and 50-50 gain mechanism. Now, the Cowpines are, are, I believe, a very good contractor. They did a very good job on, this, on the stadium. Fantastic venue. But they didn't really understand target cost contracts. And they certainly didn't understand the NEC. Gordon talked about NEC training. We gave the contractors a lot of NEC training. But we had to get across a very simple concept to them that for every pound you spend, you earn 10 pence, because that was roughly their fee, 10%. For every pound you save, you earn 50 pence, roughly, because you get 50% of the gain. So how can we work together so that you get lots of those 50 pences? And they, they, they struggle with that concept at first. Um, and it's not a, the question isn't about cutting quality, it's about you know, some of the process we put in terms of place, in terms of managing costs, managing the supply chain, managing the programme, it's all about helping the contractor to earn 50p and help our client earn 50p. Because I much prefer going to a change control meeting and said, here's some money back, rather than can I have some more contingency, please, because we've got an issue. Whilst we, we talk about going for a rigorous change control process, some of those change controls weren't always easy, and uh, we, we had to put some sort of quite detailed explanation together to get things approved. Mark um, touched on retention. We talked about this on the way up here on the train, saying, was this an incentive? You know, I think it was in terms of the fact that we didn't have penalties, and Mark touched on this. We had a very, very low level of damages on the Olympic Stadium, something like £7,000 a day, because our objective wasn't to penalise the contractor. Our objective was to get the venue on time and under budget, which we successfully achieved. Um, so we put in other measures like early completion uh, bonuses, you see milestone bonuses up there. We didn't have that on the stadium. That was on the media centre. We incentivised the contractor by delivering elements of that venue and giving them milestone bonuses. Now, the media centre, for any of you who know um, a little bit more, well, I learned about the Olympics on this programme, is that the media centre is really the revenue-generating area. You know, we talked about 20,000-plus media on the site at, at any one time. 
And that, that's where the income comes. So a lot of these things were self-funding that we put in there, the gain share mechanism, the early completion bonuses, they're all self-funding out of driving efficiency through the contract. Just going away from the slide here, because someone asked about how did you incentivise the tier two contracts. And I'd certainly say that's a lesson learned here, because I think many of the tier one contractors were uh, a you know, unused to the NEC and the target cost contract. And there certainly wasn't the appetite within the supply chain for option C contracts at tier two level. So we let, the, the main contractors let very few option C subcontracts. And I think that's something, we'll, if we went back, we'd, we'd try and target that and see how we'd change that. They generally let their tier two contracts on an option A or an option B, which is remeasurable uh, on, on that basis. In terms of effective cost management, effective cost management is driven by effective administration of the contract. And um, what Gordon said in, in his summary to Project Controls is there wasn't a single ma magic bullet on this. We did the basics right. And a lot of the administration of the contract is administering the contract and administering it correctly. The contract, the NEC, is a project management tool and it's there to be used and followed. And where we followed it, we had success. Give you an example, on the stadium, on the 31st of March 2011, we signed the completion certificate for the final account, uh, for the uh, stadium. We also signed the final account. It was signed on the same day. Compare that to Wembley. Don't know what the lawyer's fees are for Wembley, you read in the press, 30, 40, 50 million, you know, for the claims that went on and on and on. We effectively managed the contract and we were able to close that contract out very early on. Mark said we're still going through a commercial closeout process now and I've been um, sort of checking some emails in the break to see how that's actually going while I'm not in the office. And some of those contracts are contracts which were maintenance contracts beyond the game. So whilst we might only be 92% complete, there is actually still some physical works going on site, removing some of the temporary venues that we're doing. So, that is obviously, you know, in terms of what's actually been delivered and was finished prior to games, we're probably 99% complete. Just one to remember there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, we got, we've got a KPI coming up that we're incentivised against. So. I just wanted to get that one in early. Um, so in terms of cost management, Zoe talked about our WBS and, and we, you know, we, we, we had the procedures in the works information for the tier one contractors. It was very key for us to establish the work, work breakdown structure with the contractor early on and all our cost reporting procedures and make sure that the contractor delivered cost reports to us on a monthly basis. Now the contractor, it was a bit of a shock for them how much we interrogated the interrogated those reports. We really got involved in tier two reporting, understanding tier two reports coming to the contractor, something one of their clients' representatives had never got involved in, in before. We wanted to understand their, how they were managing their risk and contingency, and obviously monitoring the gain share. One way we, that helped us dive down into the tier two level of detail was being involved in the tier two procurement. Um, so I, my contract administration team were allocated to packages and had a light touch involvement in the tier two procurement. It allowed us to understand the scope and understand the risk associated with those packages in more detail. It also fed into the program detail, so we can under, and I'll come on to touch onto that when I talk a, bit, a little bit more about um, schedule control. In terms of risk management, I'm not going to cover all of this slide because I really want to focus on what we did from a project level. Uh, and we, we had a lot of work to identify and work with the contractor and understand risk and explain the risk management processes we needed to go through as, um, as part of this large organisation. Now, McAlpine did a fantastic job on the stadium, but they'd just come off the Emirates. Fantastic stadium, brilliant facility. They didn't think that CLM could add anything in terms of risk management, and I think we, we changed that and we got them heavily involved in, in analysing their, their risk, and there were certainly some lessons learned from the contractor. So in terms of risk management, three key stages, identify, assess and control. And I'm not going to try and give you a les lesson in um, risk management, just to explain what we did. We had regular meetings with the uh, contractor to discuss risk. But 
we had a uh, central risk management team of about three or four people, and they were key for me in delivering the risk management across the program because they made sure that all the risks were recorded consistently. They made sure that risks on the project which impacted on the program were elevated and vice versa. So there were program-wide risks. If there was a problem in utilities, our, as well as the milestone reports we had there as an indicator that it was a problem, the risk management guys were there as well to say, so-and-so contractor is possibly running behind program. We could flag that on our risk to see how we, that would impact on our program. And that obviously helped escalate decisions higher, and we did that through the project status report. One of the things that the, the risk, central risk team were very good at was looking at opportunities. As a project, we probably failed to look at some of the opportunities. We were, when we talked about risk, all we wanted to focus on was the things that could go wrong, rather than every now and then the risk team would come in and help us on the things that, that were going better and could be improved in terms of how could we improve the programme and how could we... Uh, improve the cost forecast. In terms of risk management, the NEC is a very good contract because it's got proactive procedures in there regarding early warning notices from both the contractor and the project manager. And one thing we're guilty of as a project manager is probably not raising enough early warnings. We, a lot of our team sat there and thought the early warning processes was something the contractor should do. It's not. It's something both parties should do. What we did too, to compensate for that is, is we made sure we had risk management meetings every week. The NEC says have a risk management meeting when there's an early warning raised if you need a risk management meeting. We went beyond that process and made sure we reviewed those every week at a project level of new issues that were coming up. Some of them wouldn't make it to the risk register, they were small items. But when they did make it to the risk register, we reviewed that as part of the monthly process. As Gordon's touched on, we use the project risk registers to form our QRA results and influence our AFC or include within our AFC requirements. One of the key risks to us was supply chain and supply chain insolvency. And I'm not going to go over and tell you about the credit crunch that we've had because I'm sure you're more than aware of that. But what was our response to that problem? We had put in place a small supply chain people, probably about three people, um, who understood all the credit scorings and monitored them for all the contractors within the supply chain, generally down at tier two and sometimes at critical tier three level. And what they did is they identified that where we had already placed a contract and there were some critical issues, we would use our logistics centres, which Jason's going to come on and talk a little bit more about in the delivery presentation, we would use those logistics centres to vest the materials and bring them onto an ODA owned and managed piece of land. So that if the subcontractors did become insolvent, at least we had the materials and we had a strategy therefore developed as to how we would install those materials. It's better than going insolvent, we can't get the materials, we need to go through a process of repeat tendering and getting a new contractor on board. We just simply didn't have the time on that. And there's some very good examples of what we did there in terms of uh, some cladding materials and also um, some temporary seating materials. The supply chain uh, insolvency team were also able to advise on capacity issues um, to the tier one contractors. They were able to say, you know, a contractor who generally turns over a million pound a year has already picked up two million pounds worth of work on the Olympic Park. To feed that back to our tier one supply chain and say, that's a consideration we need to take, you know, we need to take into account. Um, sometimes that's overlooked. The contractors were quite keen to, some of the contractors were quite, tier two contractors, quite keen to win work on the Olympic Park. Lots of other areas of risk management, which I'm not going to go into any detail, we'll pick up on interfaces and integration in the delivery uh, presentation. I think we've touched on that in the program as well. Industrial relations, uh, we'll talk about uh, in more detail, and health and safety. Lots of other risks, and I'm not going to go into how that informed the change control process, because I think Gordon has touched on that in his presentation. Whilst I said integration is going to be covered in detail in uh, future slides on the presentation, there's one thing I wanted to touch on from a project level. It's hard to find a good project manager who will always make decisions for the benefit of the program. They're very much making decisions for the benefit of the project. And as the project and the program managers 
with our integration team, I think we managed that quite successfully on the Olympics. We had some very interesting discussions with Sir Robert McAlpine saying, we're making this decision because it benefits the program. They're not interested in that. They want to they get their stadium built and they want to be one of the first venues to complete. And they did a very good job. I keep plugging Sir Robert McAlpine, don't I? I, I haven't got an interview with him, don't I? <laughs> in terms of performance and control, obviously we've talked about cost management, Close program monitoring was key for us, and there was a number of things we did uh, to understand this. The amount of times I heard contractors say, yeah, we're behind program, but we'll catch up. How will you catch up? Demonstrate to me that. And we used a lot of metrics and uh, performance curves to understand what was the volume of steel erected? What was the amount of small power completions that you terminated? And real level of detail like that, because a contractor would say, well, I've erected two tonnes of steel in the last week, but don't worry, next week I'll do 10 tonnes and the week after I'll do 50 tonnes. How are you actually going to achieve that? And by breaking down key quantities on the projects, we were able to make the, at least make, not make the decisions for the contractor, to, but, but to make them understand some of the problems that they actually faced. One of the ways we did that was we attended the Tier 2 contractors' interface meeting. So McAlpine would meet with our Tier 2 contractors on a weekly basis and have an interface meeting. We would have some of our key project managers in there. And I think someone asked a question about how did you integrate Tier 2 programmes up into Tier 1 programmes and therefore into the overall CLM programmes? Was, was it yourself? I would say that the Tier 2 programmes were not brilliant but, but in terms of them reporting on P6. But what we did is we went into these interface meetings and we made sure that the, the program that was being reported by the Tier 1 contractor was the program that the Tier 1 contractor was telling the Tier 2s, this is how we're going to manage work on a daily basis, a weekly basis or a monthly basis. So we were, whilst we weren't analysing that Tier 2 program in detail, we were making sure that the Tier 2 contractors understood the program that was being reported to us. And that gave us confidence that when we reported to the ODA, we were reporting on an accurate and a detailed, analysed programme. Gordon's already uh, put some of these slides up in terms of um, performance and um, cost reporting, and I'm just going to pick out what we did at a project level. We talked about timing before, and that was key for us to establish a timetable with the contractor for reporting. We had this 10-day period. We needed to lock down data from the contractor, and that was key. We understood a lot of information about the Tier 2 costs, so when we got cost reports in from the contractor, we didn't have too much information um, to analyse. We worked quite closely with them in terms of risks. We were able to develop that into our trends and into our simple progress report. Gordon picked this slide up on the uh, right-hand side of this slide up in the overall programme. And this is the overall cost report that we had pr produced to the ODA at a high level. So at the top, there's some simple data about where we are in terms of budget, cost. And then what we managed on a lot of the PSR and a lot of key issues, these are the key five unsubstantiated trends. These are the key five acknowledged trends. These are the key five, and there's only one on this example, out of scope items which are likely to have an impact on the project. Maybe a low cog requirement where LOCOG wanted to change, the, uh, implement something which it, uh, impacted on our scope of work. So we very much focused on key five issues, reporting those to management. And that's how we got the uh, simple dashboard reporting, um, which was elevated to the uh, executive. In terms of schedule reporting, similar issue really. Zoe talked about approximately 700 key milestones on the all milestones report. The project status report, after we'd undertaken the analysis of the contractor's programme, fed into a simple one-page summary for each project. And I appreciate you can't read this, but you can obviously see a RAG status on the right-hand side here. So what were our key milestone issues? Red and amber. So we can see from that slide, we've got about five key issues to talk about. The second column of RAG status is about what will actually impact on the programme. We had projects off-site which were delivering early and it didn't matter whether those programmes slipped by two or three months. Obviously, we didn't, want the, we didn't want projects slipping. We had these very public milestones to deliver against. 
but were they impacting on the overall programme and were they impacting on other venues, other infrastructure to be installed? So that was quite a, a, a useful tool to report in, in our um, implementation reviews. Those then fed into the critical items report, which uh, Gordon and Zoe talked about, and then fed into the strategic plan and monitored how we were going against the key scheduled deliverables. So, in summary, from a commercial perspective, we look at, was it a success? For me, it clearly was a success in terms of where we are in terms of our commercial closeout. As Mark touched on, we've only had one adjudication, which has run the full course. We've currently got two disputed accounts, which we're desperately trying to finish by the end of March and close those accounts out. So I think in terms of how this project was commercially um, managed, it has been a success. It's definitely been a success. And what are the key le lessons to be learned? As I've already said, doing the basics right, managing the contracts correctly. The NEC sets out timescales for delivery, in the, and that's not just in terms of commercial aspects, it's in terms of program, managing responses to communications. And if you can follow those basics and you reply within those and manage within those timescales, I think you can deliver success. There's lots of other things on there in terms of behaviours that we had to undertake, developing the contractor, you know, getting the contractor bought into our processes and procedures. A lot of contra I've worked uh, in contracting for quite for about 14 years. Uh, and a lot of contractors, I know, read these, in, read these requirements in the works information saying, we won't really be asked to do that. Someone's written that in an office and that's sort of theoretical. We won't actually have to do it when we get to site. I see a few people smiling there because they've obviously got the same problem with their contractors. But that's why we, man we manage the contract and we manage those deliverables that, that were required. On that note, thank you.